Thank you. So, hello, DEF CON. I'm David. I'm here to talk about terminals. Um, I actually came through four terminals on the way here from the other side of the world. Uh, my flight got rerouted, so that was four airport terminals. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'm from G Research. I work for our open source team. Um, we're not a security research company. We're a quantitative research company, and we predict things. So we use a lot of machine learning, AI, and, but we also use a lot of infrastructure underneath that. So our open source team aims to improve the infrastructure we use. Uh, we contribute some projects on top of that infrastructure. Uh, we use things like Kubernetes. Um, but we also use terminals, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So what is a terminal? Well, first of all, we need to go back in time. So we're going to go back to the 1960s, and what are terminals built on? ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. We've all heard of it. Do we know it that well? Probably, maybe. There's some strange things in it that are legacy. Um, we take it for granted. Um, this very slide has ASCII on it. Um, to give it its full name, American Standards Association X3.4-1963. Um, that looks like this. So this is the ASCII standard code. Um, now, if you look closely at this, it's got seven bits. Um, it's got this large unassigned range. Um, it's got an escape. Well, that's what a lot of this talk is about. There's also something called WRU, which is who are you? And that's a way of asking the terminal on the other end what it is. Um, and a lot of this talk will talk about that. So from the early days of the ASCII standard, replies were something that were a key part of it. So in this case, you sent a single character, WRU, and in response, the other end would probably respond with RU. Um, it turns out that this is actually all a bit vague because later on, ASCII changed, and in 1967, um, they, they added, well, lowercase, which was quite key. Um, they also moved escape. So now, if you look closely at this table, all the, all the control sequences are on the left two columns, except delete, which is actually an interesting legacy and one of those facts that I really like. So delete is where it is, because on a punch card, if you punch out all the holes, you delete a character. So sort of legacy things that we still have in ASCII are designed like that for a reason. It's one of those legacy things that doesn't hurt, but is kind of amusing. So there's a few other details about ASCII. It only defines seven bits, as I said. Um, although, interestingly, two years after this, in 1969, Vint Cerf wrote RFC 20, and that basically said that the internet should use ASCII, uh, but it also said that um, it should use 8-bit characters, which is, you know, what we expect these days. But that RFC actually defines that the 8th bit should just always be zero. So they hadn't yet actually defined what the 8th bit was, but they were leaving room for expansion. So there's, there's a lot of sort of history here, and if you're interested in character encodings, um, there's some references for this talk. Um, there's uh, books on it. Um, IBM were very involved in it, and some other things. So um, 60 years ago, there were some proposals on escape. So before ASCII was even officially published as a standard, uh, Bob Bemer, um, who was an employee of IBM, wrote an article in Communications of the ACM called A Proposal for Character Code Compatibility, which is a bit of a wordy thing. But basically, it was saying, we've got this single character set, but what are we going to do if we need to put international characters in and so on? And that was where escape was defined as a mechanism that allowed basically to say something different is coming after this point. Um, and, you know, everyone here who's done freaking or anything knows how great in-band signaling is. So basically, this is in-band signaling. Um, and so the second reference is from 1963, and that was written by someone at AT&T, um, you know. So they, they really loved in-band signaling. And so they, they, this was a proposed discipline for the use of escape. And this was kind of the first time that what escape might mean was defined. And it's very interesting to sort of go back at the history of this. And one of the key things it actually defines is not what escape does, but how, 
how it is parsed, essentially. And so it says that particular letters or symbols after escape will, will either continue the escape sequence or end it. Um, and that later becomes relevant. So what was ASCII actually used in? So in 1963, the Teletype Model 33 was released. Um, and this was one of the first devices to use ASCII. Um, it's kind of lost to history exactly what was using it, but you know, this, this was a thing you could type into and um, it was used in the development of Unix. So sitting down here, um, this is 1972, Ken Thompson is sitting down and Dennis Ritchie is standing up. Um, Ken is sitting at a teletypewriter or a TTY. So this Unix machine has two TTYs. Um, you know, we still call them TTYs, but they're not that device anymore. They're something quite different. But this is where terminals started. So in 1976, Leah Siegler um, released the ADM3A. Um, now, this wasn't the first glass terminal. That was released by Datapoint in the early 70s. But this was one of the first affordable terminals, at least for the time, in kit form. It cost under a thousand US dollars. Um, and the University of California, Berkeley, standardized on these for um, various uses. And um, Bill Joy had one of these. And if we look closely at the keyboard, um, on the very left-hand side are the configuration options. So you open a panel and change dip switches to um, adjust the speed and other things like that. But if you look very closely at the H, J, K, and L keys, you see they've got arrows. And if you're a Vim user, uh, you might be familiar with what those do. Um, so that, this terminal was used by Bill Joy in the development of the X editor, which had a mode called VI. And as we all know, the rest is history. So this was the first device that was used to develop the visual editor that we now know on Unix. Um, and there's another Unix uh, reference here. If you look at the top right-hand side, the home button has a tilde on it. And that's obviously what the home directory is these days. Exactly whether it, this is the exact reason that that is the case. People think so, but it's kind of lost in time. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of Unix history here. But why is this also interesting? Well, this was also one of the first terminals that let you position the cursor anywhere on the screen. Um, this is from the manual, which someone has kindly preserved. Um, and it basically says that the escape key can be used in conjunction with character keys to position the cursor anywhere on the screen. So rather than just moving the cursor up and down, you can say, I want it you know, five rows down, two across, whatever it is, which lets you essentially implement any kind of editor or a visual application, at least as far as you can go visually, in a terminal. Um, and this was one of the first devices to support this kind of thing. Um, some of the earlier terminals only supported moving up and down, so it was more inefficient, especially over at the time people were using 300 board modems to talk to things. So if you imagine you have to send multiple characters to move the cursor around, you can literally see the cursor move. Um, so the interesting thing in, in this document is actually somewhere in the middle. It says, this operation may also be initiated by the host computer. So the user can type this as an escape sequence, or the computer can basically say, position this where I want on the screen. And basically, that makes VI possible. So in 1978, the VT100 was re released. And this was really continuing the introduction of more and more features into terminals. Um, but the, the interesting thing about the VT100 is it was one of the first terminals to implement this standard which is known as X3.64-1979. Um, but many people know this simply of, as ANSI. Um, so we'll get to what that means. But to give it its full name, additional controls for use with American National Standard Code for Information Interchange. So basically, this was, as I said earlier, there was a working group on escape. That working group turned into this standard. Um, there were some other details along the way, but this was the final product. Um, the standard was actually released in 1979, so the VT100 was built in development of that standard, and DEC actually released it before the standard was released, so very, very close together development. I haven't looked that closely at the history there, but it's quite interesting. But what does the VT100 give us? So it gives us escape sequences like this. So um, I'm using C star strings here, so slash E is the escape character, and then the other things you see are just the symbols you expect them to be. 
So, like I said, a particular sequence is defined. So here, the left bracket opens a particular kind of escape sequence. Then you can have numbers, semicolons, and then usually a letter ends the sequence. So here, the top one sets the top and bottom margins, which is a deck-specific one based on the name. Um, the, the bottom two are positioning the cursor, and those are ANSI standard ones. They don't have a deck prefix to the name. So we can actually just demo this. So like on a VT100 emulator, we can just, in a command line, we can run printf, um, and this, this will do something. Um, sorry, this bit is not. So I'm actually using OpenBSD to demo this. So here I am just logging in as root, as you do. Um, but a console is a VT100 emulator. And here I can just type printf. Um, and I've now limited myself to the top 10 lines of the screen. So if I type clear, you can now see I, I'm still hitting enter, but nothing, I don't go further down the screen. But I can use an escape sequence to move further down the screen. So I've now moved myself outside that restricted region using the deck escape sequence. Now I can move 2,000 lines down. Oh. So OpenBSD just rebooted when I moved 2,000 lines down then. So uh, what just happened? Um, so um, have you tried forcing an unexpected reboot? So that was a present day OpenBSD bug. Um, it resulted in this reliability fix in early 2023, and I found that basically the VT100 emulation, which was originally written for NetBSD in 1998. I don't think anyone had ever really audited it. So um, basically, yeah, you asked it to move around the screen, and there was some kind of, it was basically just a bounds checking error, um, as, it, as it says there. Um, I later found another bug, so there's a further reliability fix. While I was writing this talk, I was like, that's strange. So um, it turns out also, if, if you look at those escape sequences, um, I said you can have numbers and semicolons and things. It turns out if you just send four gigabytes of semicolons, you, you, over, you overflowed something. Um, both of these will either cause a kernel panic or a reboot, depending on exactly how they're arranged. Um, I don't believe they're exploitable further. I'm sure someone might prove me wrong. But um, I would expect that address randomization and other recent additions to kernels limit a lot of this, and also um, on a 64-bit system, you're probably far enough away and you can't actually set a more than 32-bit parameter. So maybe a 32-bit system without any address randomization might be exploitable. So, you know, if you went back to when this code was written in 1998 and found this bug, it would probably be far more interesting than it is right now. But no one found it then, fortunately or unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's interesting that this bug has existed in OpenBSD and NetBSD for, you know, 25 years. But there you go. So let's go to the 1980s now. Um, PCs. So DOS 2.0 introduced a driver called ANSI.sys. Um, and actually, this is, this is a screenshot from PCJS.org, which is an awesome web-based uh, PC emulator. And it actually is quite a faithful emulation of PCs. It's not just like trying to make sure that x86 works. It really does have the IBM BIOS and some other things. So you can go there, type in those commands. And if you see at the bottom where I've typed CLS and piped it to more, that's actually something that is built into DOS. If you type CLS um, and it's not directly connected to the screen, then it will output the escape sequence. In this case, I've not actually rebooted after I've um, said to load ANSI.sys. So this is the default DOS behavior. You just see the escape character on the screen. If, if you do this on the PCJS emulator, you reboot, then it will actually um, run, run that um, code. So that's, that's how that works. Um, unfortunately, I have minor technical issues. I mean, this particular demo is not going to work. Um, so I was going to demo what happens with um, ANSI.sys on a more recent DOS. So basically, um, bulletin boards and things use ANSI.sys. 
and it was kind of awesome, you know, combined with this particular IBM code page. This is IBM code page 437. So I, I mentioned that um, what ASCII is, but if we look at the second half of this, um, there's, there's some custom characters, and then these are the IBM PC specific characters. And these, combined with the escape sequences that the ANSI sys driver um, gives you, allows you to do art like this. This was taken from a um, Dreams of Insanity bulletin board, the, um, the intro to it. Um, and you can find this online on textfiles.com or other places. So how you can actually view this on a modern computer is you can actually use iConf to convert from IBM code page 437. Um, and then you can pipe it to PV, which is a command line tool that can do various pipe-like things on Unix. And in this case, I'm asking it to slow down enough to, that it behaves like a 28K modem. And if you run that, unfortunately, the demo is not working for reasons. But um, basically, you'll see the output just below it. Um, and what that actually looks like when you, when you um, look at it in a raw form is something like this. So you can see the, the text is actually um, sort of here and here, but there's all these control characters here. So it's kind of hard if you actually just open this in an editor to see what it's doing. And that, of course, brings us to a potential attack. So there's something called ANSI bombs. Now, the ANSI sys driver had a special ability to redefine keys. So if you could write something to someone's screen, you could redefine keys. Now, um, what I'm showing there is actually a still detected by some antiviruses. That is a real virus. Um, and it basically says, for particular keys, redefine them. So if you type this to the screen like it tells you to, you do type help.txt, which is, for those who've forgotten how DOS works, that's the same as cat to the screen, basically. So raw cat is a bad idea. Raw type is a bad idea on DOS um, a long time ago. So anyway, you, you, you do that. And then you hit Enter. And what that actually expands to is a Dell tree. So if we just go back, each one of these, the first, the first um, sort of part of the sequence is which um, character to redefine. Sorry, I'm just sorry about that. Um, so that's which character to redefine. Um, and it's if we go if we go right back to the ANSI table, which I won't do right now, but you'll see that my my favourite one here is um, so 27 is escape. We'll talk about that a bit later. Eight is a good one. That's backspace. So you, you think you've made a, a mistake, and then you press backspace, and this, this silly, basically, this is a prank. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, um, bombs are always a prank. But um, anyway, the, um, it, it redefines certain keys if you cat this to your screen. And maybe you don't in, in, immediately realize this. There were many different variants of this. Like, some were sort of weird, and you maybe didn't even touch that key. So you didn't know it happened. And then later on, you randomly press it. So um, this wasn't really considered a real security thing back in the day. But it's kind of amusing, because it's a predecessor to some of the things I'm going to get to. So yeah, probably bad deleting your C drive. Um, and this, this worked, as you can see here, this was on DOS 6.2.2. I demoed this. But it worked all the way back to DOS 2 if you loaded the ANSI sys driver, which not everyone did. And there were also secure versions of the ANSI sys driver. But obviously, this was the 90s and the 80s, so CVEs weren't really a thing and stuff like that. So you know, um, some of these attacks that I'm talking about are older than you may realize. So let's go to the 90s. So this was from um, FRAC in 1994. And it's a utility called flash.c. Um, and so it says here, it's to find, design, intended to quickly mess up a user's terminal by issuing a talk request and sending special characters. And it says it's really nasty. So let's, let's have a look at what that actually is. So it sends these evil strings. So I won't go into exactly what they all do, um, but one of the ones that I mentioned earlier um, and was the limiting to the top 10 lines of the screen. Well, this is limiting you to the top three lines of the screen. So already that's quite annoying, because you've got a really large terminal and you can only see three lines. Um, it also inverts the background color. Um, one of them is a deck specific sequence that sends a test pattern to the screen, which basically means it fills the screen with ease. So, yeah. Um, 
But just a quick aside, because if you looked at this, you see that says slash 033. So that's octal. So 033 is actually 27 um, in, ask, in uh, character numbers in decimal. So there are many ways to represent escape. I've already in this presentation shown three at the top. Um, but you can also use JSON, and Stocks Talk uh, mentioned that you probably should escape certain output to the screen using that. So uh, yeah, you can do that in JSON. Um, if you're writing stuff in Go, then it doesn't do C style strings, so slash x1b, and in some cases, just slash 27. Um, and we'll get to some other variants on this in a moment. Um, but yeah, so if you see this in various different forms, just be aware that like, there are many ways to represent escape. Um, so, hello, DEF CON. Um, this is a VT520. Uh, my dog also says hi. Um, so, November 1995, this was released. Now, Windows 95 was obviously released before this. So, this was, this was newish tech for the time. It did some fancy things. But in the terminal world, it was new. In the real computer world, most people are actually using X terms. And if we, if we uh, go back to this flash.c, it says in the middle that it's actually expecting to target an X term. But let's, let's just uh, be time appropriate here. So what happens if we simulate receiving flash.c uh, terminal DOS attack? Um, Oops. Ah, OK. Um, this is, I'm just going to have to switch inputs. This is going to be a bit crazy, because I thought I had this video copy, but I don't. Um, Yeah, so sorry this flickers both because the video recording of this is kind of bad, but also uh, there's an issue with the projector. But what happens is the screen goes blank anyway. So this is kind of annoying. So if you send, if you send this to a real terminal, uh, a reboot of it takes several seconds. So you literally send escape and C, and the real terminal breaks. If we remove the escape and C, and we send that, then we see roughly what we would have seen in X term or another terminal. So it starts flashing a lot, and inverts the background. And now when we start typing, we also see um, our, our characters are not the normal characters. So there's a DEX special alphabet that is um, designed for box drawing and things, a bit like we saw the PC um, had its own. So um, yeah, we, we then went reset, and we can see what, see what happened. But notice reset didn't reset the fact that the screen was inverted. So this really messed up your terminal. Send these things to the terminal, and it's kind of broken. So, yeah. Um, so let's go to 2003. So HD Moore did some research and published this article in Bug Track and Full Disclosure at the time, Terminal Emulator Security Issues. Um, and now this is some of the first proper research. CVEs were still relatively new at the time. Um, that's in quotes because it was rather than CVEs, it was actually CANs. Um, it's just going to go blank for a second. So these were CANs, and they, they later became CVEs. Um, so is that going to come back? Let me just type XR on our commands for a moment. So yeah, so this was among the first published um, CVEs. And so one of, the, one of the ones in here is about window title reporting. So um, I've mentioned this in some previous talks, so sorry if you've seen that before, but um, I think it's important to repeat some of this. Um, so what does this look like? So if we print something to the screen, um, like I showed before, you can print escape sequences to change positions on the screen and move things around. This is a special escape sequence to set the title. So 
your shell prompt will often include the command to set your, the title, for example. Um, so what happens if we set it to calc.exe? Well, that's not bad. But some terminals have a special sequence to ask for a reply of what the title is. Um, so you ask for what the title is, it replies with what the title is. Um, and so then this looks something a bit like this. Uh, uh, which one are we doing? This one. So, yeah, so we, we do something like this, and uh, calc.exe opens back here. So it's literally that simple. Um, but, yeah. So, this is interesting. This wasn't an old vulnerability. I just ran that against uh, Con EMU, which is a Windows terminal. So, that vulnerability from Xterm um, also exists on Con EMU and Swift Term and West Term. Um, the Con EMU is one is the most concerning, though, because actually what I, what I did back um, here. If you look closely, I put a slash x0d, which is also known as carriage return. So in this case, I didn't have to press enter. The terminal pressed enter for me. And that, that makes these attacks much more scary. It's either before you had to social engineer the user into pressing enter somehow. Um, but it turns out, um, actually, you don't always have to do that. So there are other ways to deliver this. I use printf. Obviously, a user running printf is a bit like someone in a JavaScript console, ask, ask them to open the JavaScript console and attack themselves. But you can run curl on things, and curl is just like catting something to the screen. So here I have an evil example.com that when you, cat, when you query it and get, get, the, get it with curl, it says, I am good. You pipe it to the shell, and it says, I am evil. And down at the bottom, I've piped it to cat minus v, so you can see what's happening. And actually, there's a comment and then a lot of backspace characters. So basically, what you see is, I am good when you cat it. But what the shell sees is, I am evil, followed by a comment. So you can basically make the user run one, see that they're going to run one thing, and then uh, run something different. Um, this is actually kind of interesting, because some recent attacks in the past year were called Trojan, Trojan Source, where people used Unicode um, to achieve similar effects in text editors. So these kind of things have been possible in basically anywhere you have text. Sometimes text is not just pure ASCII. There are other things in it, escape characters, Unicode, right to left overrides, other things. So these, these things can apply in various ways. Um, so cat minus v is considered good. Um, in the 80s, um, the original Unix people from Bell Labs wrote an article called Cat Minus V Considered Harmful because they thought that cat shouldn't actually have any command line options and it should be its own thing, which is kind of amusing. But Cat Minus V is a good idea. Anything can potentially, that can potentially write raw text to your terminal is harmful, so you can pipe it to Cat Minus V and see what's happening. Um, alternatively, the program itself, if it expects to print to a terminal, should just do the escaping itself. Um, so we've used curl. What else can we do? Well, it's always DNS, isn't it? So this is a bit crazy, but um, it turns out you can put lots of things in DNS. So the easy place to do this is text records. I can put stuff in text records. But it turns out I can also, in many cases, put um, funny characters just in the host name itself. Um, the interesting thing about that is, depending what libc you're running, it may or may not resolve. So um, what, I, what I'm sort of proposing as a slightly crazy delivery method here is someone finds out that they can't access this host, but someone else says they can, so they start debugging it. Um, and it turns out that on Alpine, you can ping the, the relevant host, because it does follow the CNAME chain to the crazy thing. Um, but um, glibc doesn't. Um, and actually, I, due to an unrelated vulnerability, I um, actually made OpenBSD change their behavior. So OpenBSD. Older versions for about 7.3, this does work. Newer versions, it doesn't. Um, you can also use this to tell the difference between Mac OS and Windows, potentially. So I reckon there's some like fun things there. Like, you know, anyway, I, uh, that's kind of an aside. Um, so what can we do with this? So Windows Terminal, it turns out, supports um, some kind of music thing. Um, so yeah. Let's see if we can make this work. 
Uh, I just, oh, that's not going to work because I don't have any sound. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, because I've changed device here, um, that, that sound output's not going to work. But anyway, so you, you run that in Windows, um, and it turns out it starts playing, playing music here, um, which is kind of fun. But what did I just actually show you? Well, I showed you that if you run NS Lookup, then uh, it actually just writes raw, raw things to the screen. So it turns out um, if you actually have another bug, Say, for example, uh, you have a bug in a tool called Commander, which actually is based on Connie MU that I just spoke about. Um, so here we are. Um, we just do an NS lookup on ConnieMU.lab. Um, so, yeah. Um, the interesting thing about this is. The interesting thing about this is I previously disclosed this as a bug. Um, but actually, this still works on the fixed version. Um, I had a bit of a discussion with the author of uh, Connie MU about this. But um, if you look very closely, I'm using Control O here rather than pressing Enter. So it turns out what the, what the author did to fix this originally was look for carriage return and line feed. But um, it turns out if you're using a read line compatible um, shell, and this is, this is Commander, which ad adds a bunch of Unix tools to Windows, then basically it, um, yeah, it runs, when you, when, you pr when you press Control O, it actually is bound to something like history, add, and accept, which is the same as pressing Enter as far as an anything is concerned. So, yeah, that's a thing. So, so I'm going to have to speed up slightly because we've got a few more of those to come. Um, so we're not done with DNS. Um, it turns out there are other tricks you can play with DNS. So Apple Terminal is actually relatively secure. I looked at it for a while and didn't find anything. Um, but it does have a way of setting what your working directory is. So the way this works is the same way that I said that a title integrates with your shell prompt. You also in in integrate with your shell prompt and send the terminal a hidden escape sequence that tells it what working directory you're currently in, which is, you know, that makes sense. It's like useful to tell um, the terminal what working directory you're in um, because it turns out up here you have a thing that tells you that you're in either the temp or your home directory, and it gives a, you a pretty icon of your home if you're in your home directory. Anyway, uh, if, if you actually read what's happening on the slide here, um, so I can, I can print users DGL, first of all. That works fine. Um, I can also, it turns out, put a host name in the file URL. Um, and over here, it does a DNS lookup on that file URL. So it's, it's not like the end of the world, but it's an information leakage thing in that if I, for some reason, am connected to a server um, that maybe doesn't have access to the outside world, but the computer that I'm connecting from does, uh, some, some malicious thing on that server could write something to my terminal, and then it could actually, through DNS, tunnel it back to wherever. So you can use DNS as an exfiltration method via the terminal that some user is connected via. Um, so I reported this to Apple in, um, as you can see here, um, October 2022, uh, and they unfortunately haven't fixed it yet, so they're quite past the disclosure deadline for this one. It still works as far as I'm aware. Uh, I haven't tested the very latest version, but um, it turns out there's also another bug, which is kind of fun. Um, if, you, if you actually um, get to about um, 1,024 characters, somewhere around there, um, when you open a new tab, what it tries to do is change into that directory. And this, this sort of CD command you see on screen here is what it wrote. Um, so it does that sort of for you. Um, it turns out if it's longer than the allowed uh, directory name length on Mac OS, then it just hangs the entire terminal. So it's kind of like, a bit like a sleeping time bomb in that if you run that, then the terminal, next time someone opens a new tab, will just hang, and they won't actually know why. Um, the one, the one saving grace there is if this actually is integrated for your prompt, um, the next time the prompt is displayed, it will clear that, and then it won't work. So um, it's not the end of the world. Um, so new, back in H.D. Moore's paper in 2003, there was a fictitious case study, and it talk, spoke about Apache logs. 
Uh, what's more relevant today? So developers run things like Python, free HTTP command lines. And if you saw Stocks Talk, I'm afraid this is basically the same demo. Um, but which one are we on? Uh, there we go. So we've got an attacker down here and a victim up the top. Um, we can't put escape characters in via just using curl, but if we write um, raw to the screen, uh, you, sorry, the screen. If we write using netcat, um, we, can, we can write things. And it turned out Python didn't escape the log, lo the log file. Um, so we can change the color of the logs. Fine, that's kind of fun. Um, so it turns out if we've got a terminal vulnerability, uh, we can do things with that as well. Um, this is item two. And the vulnerability was that it would reply with a user controllable string. So what it's supposed to be used for is querying the color. So here it's telling us that the color is 31M red. Um, I just changed the color back to uh, the default color, and it says it's zero. Um, but it turns out, yeah, if we put something else there, then it replies up here with something else. And it turns out that can be anything else. So the real insight is that we can put control C there. So by putting control C there, it will basically kill Python. Um, and at that point, we can run anything we want in the, in the terminal. So we put control C. Um, because of how this works in item two, we kind of have to split each control character into its own escape sequence. But it turns out Python just doesn't care what the HTTP request looks like. So we can just really put any characters we feel like in the, in, in the request thing. And eventually, calculator pops up. So so that was a bug in item two that was fixed. Um, and as, as I mentioned, the request selection or setting, which is a deck specific escape sequence used for querying the color and thing, there was an impl implementation bug in that. Um, and yeah, it unexpectedly echoed a string back. Control C is also a part of a string, so we can press Control C. Um, and I call this a full echo back. Um, so, how about another one? So this is Git for Windows, or also known as Git Bash. So here we're cloning a Git repository. Um, we, we go into this Git repository. It's called bad Git. Interesting. Uh, we run Git log. Um, so what, what does Git log normally do? Well, Git log opens calculator today. Um, so if we pipe that to cat minus v, um, we'll see up here it says, just below is an escape sequence that will own you. And that's actually in the commit log of this Git repository. Um, and it's also a cross-platform exploit, as you might notice, because this is actually the same bug as the item 2 one. It's DEC RQSS. Um, and it turned out Mintity on Windows was vulnerable to this. Um, so yeah. Sorry, slides loading slowly here, but we'll get there. So yeah, so Git uses less as a pager. And less had a bug in its OSC8 hyperlink handling. So there's a way of embedding hyperlinks in terminals now. Um, less supports this so that things like man pages can make their links in them clickable. Um, it turns out that um, if you've got a bug in less and a bug in a terminal, then it means that anything you write to basically anywhere in Git, you can then write that. Uh, escape characters to the screen. So, so the actual issue is that um, here, where I've got, if you remember earlier, I said that escape C is like a terminal reset thing. Um, it turns out that um, Les wasn't looking for particular escape characters ending something. So here, this, this ended it as far as Mintity was concerned, but it didn't end the escape sequence inside the OSC8 as far as um, Les was concerned. Um, and the funny thing about this is um, this, this bug was disclosed earlier this year. Um, I, I, in the posting of it, I, I sort of said it was a denial of service attack. And then later on, I worked out, actually, I'll, this can also be used for a bit more um, when I found a terminal exploit. Um, I don't know if anyone else noticed that. But anyway, um, so we're getting a bit low on time, so I'm going to run a little bit faster here. So basically, this, this deck RQS thing I showed was actually an Xterm bug. And it's funny, because it was documented incorrectly in the Xterm manual um, of control sequences. And then various other terminals have 
um, recreated similar bugs. Um, so let's just go to a slightly different thing. So we've got a shared system. Administrator gets an alert about excessive memory usage, starts debugging. Uh, what, what command do you run? Top, someone said. Good. So what if there was a bug in top? Mm. Which video is it? That one. Um, so here I've got top. Um, oops, that went too quickly. Anyway, I've got a, a script running on the, on the. Sorry, we'll try that again. I forgot how short this video was. So here we're running top minus capital O. Sorry, minus O capital res. Um, and on the left hand side we've got a little script running. Um, and what just happened? Well, you got owned. So. It turns out this is an X-term bug in its optional graphics support. Um, so basically, we can do something like this. So we can get escape sequences into, into top. Um, Regis is a particular graphics uh, thing that Digital invented um, in the 80s, and some of their terminals supported this. So if you tell Xterm to run in compatibility mode of one of those terminals, and then you print some special sequence, it replies with something like A1 equals XXX. And the exploit essentially is you can build up a, you don't get very many characters, but you can build up an environment variable if you run about 10 different processes. Um, so it's a bit obscure. Um, the Xterm Regis support isn't default. Some distributions enable it. Uh, hello, NixOS. Um, but Top 3.x doesn't do escaping. 4.x does. Very few distros have it. Um, I failed to convince the top authors that this is a security problem. As far as they're concerned, there are other ways to spoof things in top. So it's actually the terminal's problem. Um, and this can also be used as a Docker escape. So if you're running as the administrator outside Docker and you run top, you still see processes inside Docker. So potentially, there are other avenues to this. Um, but we can also use attack Kubernetes here. So uh, let's have a look at Windows Terminal. Uh, so this is Windows Terminal. Um, here I'm just running BusyBox um, and deliberately running this as a nobody user. So this is you know not um, no special privileges here. But there is this interesting file called Termination Log. Um, and so if we write an exploit to termination log, um, and then actually we just exit. We, for whatever reason, this container's just died. So the administrator starts debugging what's happening here. Um, so how do you debug Kubernetes? You run kubectl. Um, so there's this pod running. Um, it's just said it's restarted. So maybe the administrator got an alert it restarted or something. Um, so the first thing you run is kubectl describe that pod. Um, and then nothing really happens. Uh, there's no, there's no message, which is a bit strange. But yeah, the, the victim over here doesn't really know what's happening. Uh, they start debugging a bit more. So they decide that they're going to duplicate this tab so they can have more context. So this was, uh, I'm going to skip that one. Um, so that was a Windows terminal bug. Um, but. What can we do with documented escape characters? Well, it turns out there are certain replies that do interesting things. So um, if, for example, we ask what color something is, colors in some terminals are separated with um, slashes. Um, and where can we find lack of escaping? So we can create, put files on disk and see if things do that. Um, it turns out NMCLI on Linux, if we happen to connect to a wireless network with an escape character in it, will happily, uh, I've got a network at home called red, which is actually the color red. Um, Bluetooth CTL on Linux mostly doesn't escape things. Uh, some of these are hard to exploit. You don't get very many characters. But like I showed with top, you could maybe create lots and lots of uh, devices or networks or something. And you know, comment forms on website. Uh, see Stocks Talk for more on that. Um, but let's have a quick demo. I'm running out of time, so I'm going a little bit faster than expected here. But um, here I've got a script that 
sets up um, a particular thing in slash TMP. And so now I'm just typing CD slash TMP. Um, and I hit tap, like you often do, right, to see what's, what's exists in that directory. Um, so when I hit tab, what happened? Uh, my cursor disappears. That's strange. Um, so I'm not sure what happens. I press Control C, and then I hit Enter, and everything goes red, and it all gets a bit broken. So what just happened there? So the slides for this will be up later. I'm going to skip this quickly. But basically, you hide the cursor, you ask what color it is, and because you're in a controlled directory slash TMP, you created a file that the shell printed out on screen and basically, magically, the user basically has to hit enter. You make it, there's an escape sequence for Xterm that makes it so control C just writes some escape characters to the screen. So there's literally nothing you can do except close the terminal or press enter. So you social engineer the user into they probably press enter because they think their terminal's broken. Um, so how do you protect yourself from all this? So terminals are just like a browser. They deal with untrusted input. Um, ensure correct output escaping. See this talk, stocks talk. Secure settings. That's, that's a fun one. Uh, if you use iTerm2, just go and turn this on right now unless you actually use the shell integration features. There might be bugs there. Who knows? Um, also, ST is a cool terminal. You should use it. It's like really basic. If you don't actually want the features your terminal gives you, then you limit your exposure by using basic things. There's probably some end days here. Um, so I'm crazy, and if you've got a phone or something, try SSHing to uh, that particular um, IP address. It's on the DEF CON network. Um, it will test your terminal. Um, and uh, I want to make this repository public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many buttons do you have to press to do that? Oh, really? OK, anyway, so I just published that. So in writing that tool, I found another bug. Uh, yeah. Um, that's all the bugs I found. Uh, thank you very much.